another edition of the Affair Care podcast. Uh, my name is Cindy Taylor. I'm the co-founder of Affair Care, along with my dear hubby, who is the man behind the camera. And this is the second in our little series about biblical precepts. And if you missed, last week we had the introduction to our Biblical Precepts series. This week we're going to go over the Old Testament and uh, what the Old Testament precepts were regarding adultery. One of the first things that I would like to just review very quickly is what adultery is. And that would be, uh, we mentioned last week, that adultery is when you are solicited away from faithfulness into, oddly enough, into idolatry. And I like this definition because it um, indicates how adultery, I mean, like, sort of how it comes about, which is with that solicitation that, like, like you're being drawn away, you're kind of just gradually being kind of pulled. Adultery, as we know, marriage is an example of the relationship that we have with God. And so adultery in a marriage here on earth is an example of the way that we act when we are faithless toward God. Uh, he is faithful to us, he's the faithful spouse, and we are the, uh, the cheating spouse and we turn to other gods. In our instance we're dealing with adultery here on earth uh, in um, you know in our marriages our marriages here on earth and um, just to be clear when when we talk um, you know any of this could be useful and fruitful for uh, any human being or person on the planet but we specifically aim toward people who are Christians that is to say that um, they have heard the the good news that that they're, they're sinners and that Jesus died for their sin and covered that and they believe it. So we aim towards Christians. There are other ways that people do things and that's just not our target who we're aiming at. So adultery would be, for example, you know, if people are living together, there is some expectation of maybe exclusivity because we're living together, but there's not a marriage. A covenant uh, as defined in the Bible some of the topics may be helpful but it's not what we're aiming at here today we're starting with the biblical precepts in the Old Testament a lot of Christians view the Old Testament like well hey we're in the time of grace now and we don't have to do the the law anymore and the Old Testament is irrelevant to me then so they don't really look at the Old Testament and unfortunately I, I guess I would say I, I disagree I believe that the whole Bible is offered um, it is profitable. Uh, it's the, in, the inspired word of God in the sense that God breathed and moved through the writers and he gave it to us for a reason. So to my mind, I look at the Old Testament as uh, this is stuff before Christ came, but it still gives us a lot of information about God's mind and what pleases him and what does not please him and how he would like us to live. To prepare for this study, what I did is I, I went and I got I found every single instance in the Old Testament where the word adultery was used. Then I read through them all and kind of tried to come up with how do they relate or how can, can we talk about this. And I've come up with three, uh, three topics from the Old Testament. The first one is, to make no mistake, God does not ever condone adultery. And I take this tone from the commandments. The uh, ad- Adultery is condemned by God by word. <laughs> he says, uh, Exodus 20, 14, I'm going to quote it here, so I, that's why I'm holding it up and reading it. Exodus 20, 14, do not commit adultery. Now, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. It's not... Unless, of course, I call you to minister to me, in which case you go ahead and commit adultery so that I can get you with the, the guy you like better. It says, do not commit adultery. Period. Same, uh, Deuteronomy 5.18. It's the exact same words. Do not commit adultery. And what happened is, uh, the Egyptians, you know, the, the Hebrews were brought out of Egypt, and that whole generation of people, they didn't really trust God and whatnot. And so they got the commandments, and then they did not follow God. They did not believe in him. They didn't listen to him. And so what he said is, okay, you guys are going to wander around in the desert for 40 years till your generation dies. And when the next generation came up, they reread the, the, the commandments again. That was Deuteronomy. 
and then that generation did affirm those commandments. So there's no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no escape clauses. There's no God condones adultery if. <laughs> God condemns adultery. I don't care how you try to justify it. God condemns adultery. In the Old Testament, uh, adultery was extremely serious and was punishable by death. That's Leviticus 20.10. And also, again, in uh, a verse Deuteronomy 22.22, 22, these verses talk about how uh, adultery, when somebody is caught in adultery, not only is the guy supposed to be condemned because he's the head or whatever. No, both the man and the woman are supposed to be killed because God takes adultery very seriously. The next little, you know, you know, God does not condone adultery. The part of it is that um, murder and adultery were equivalent in God's eyes. Now, this one was honestly kind of a shocker for me. Um, so I want to actually read to you the verse that says that. Excuse me while I turn to my little thing here. It's, it's Ezekiel 23, 45. And here's the words. It says, Men who are right with God will sentence the sisters to be punished. They will be punished in the same way as women who commit adultery and murder. After all, they have committed adultery and their hands are covered with the blood of the people they've murdered. Adultery and murder are the same thing in God's eyes. We always think, well, the big sin, you know, murder, killing people. Adultery is condemned by God. God does not ever condone adultery. And then finally, uh, I would use Malachi 3, verse 5, as, a, as a, an indication adulterers face God's judgment. He will speak against them in the judgment day. Um, so, the very first precept that I would say is extremely clear in the Old Testament is that God does not ever condone adultery. It is condemned by God. The second topic is, is a little bit interesting and fun. It's um, the lure of adultery. It's sort of like, what is how does adultery go? Uh, this is discussed in pretty good detail in Proverbs 6 and 7. First, adultery begins with lust. We see in Proverbs 6, 25, it talks about lust. Now, I want to talk a quick second here about lust. The dictionary definition of lust is, this is a quote, intense or unrestrained sexual craving or an overwhelming desire. Or craving. So then I looked in the Bible dictionary on that Bible tools site that I told you about and that one says that the word the Hebrew word that's used in the Old Testament is a strong longing or desire often of a sexual nature but uh, what's interesting is that it's used relatively infrequently in the scriptures just 29 times and there is a common theme running through every single occurrence in the scripture. And that is that the word is never used in a positive context. Now you can imagine, sometimes it can be positive to say, I, you know, intensely desire to be a better person. I intensely desire to please my husband. That's not what they're talking about here. They're, every single time this particular word is used in the scripture, it is in a negative light, relating primarily to, to two things, either a strong desire for sexual immorality or idolatrous worship. Okay, so the Hebrew words that are used are hua or hamad, okay? And they are used for a strong desire that is negative and forbidden. Uh, again, I'll say, a deep desire to obtain fulfillment for yourself. And indeed, the way that it's often pre presented is like the unregenerate are governed and controlled by deceitful lusts and desires like this. So it begins with lust. We want something. And you'll notice that the, the desire for the fulfillment is for yourself. It's selfish. It's self-centered. It's not like the godly example of sexuality where you are relating intimately with another person 
putting them first, thinking of them and their pleasure. Does that make sense? This is the exact opposite. Next, in Proverbs 7, verse 5, we see that uh, it continues with smooth talk. Now, in these verses, Proverbs 6 and 7, it's talking about a lady who is adulterous. She's married, her husband has some money, and he has taken off for like a month-long trip, which that's kind of stupid by itself. He's taken off, and while he's out, she's playing the harlot. She's being um, adulterous. So she starts with smooth talk. And I thought that was really in, uh, important to note because in adultery, both males and females will employ that technique of uh, compliments, flattery, feeding the ego, wow, you did a great job, and pretty soon that kind of catches your interest. And that's how it continues. Con moving along, we notice in Proverbs 7.7 7, that it is a trap to the people who are foolish. So here's what happens. Along comes a fellow who is not, I, I, I use the word foolish, but it said he has no sense. This is a guy who is, he's not really aware. He's just kind of bumbling along. He's not very smart. And he's not being caught. He's not being careful. He's just foolish. And he's bumbling along and he, he hears this lady's words and he's trapped. Okay, And this is the part where you'll hear um, a lot of times the disloyal spouses will say something like, it just happened. See, they stepped in the trap and they got trapped. They got caught. All of a sudden, they're hooked. Next, keep on moving along. Proverbs uh, 7, verses 8 to 10, it talks about how it's secretive. So here comes this fellow who's not too, too bright. He gets hooked into the trap. He's, he's, he's hooked. Well, so what does he do? He sneaks in the night when it's not bright, and he goes down to her back door. So it's not during daylight. It's not something he wants everyone to know. He doesn't do it in broad daylight for everyone to see. He's keeping a secret. And again, we all know that adultery is, that's how adultery happens. It's something you justify and you keep making secrets. Uh, you, you hide stuff from your, your spouse, your loyal spouse. So it's secretive. And then the last part about it is it's seductive. And this is uh, Proverbs uh, 7 in the next verses, uh, 16 to 21. She talks about uh, how she kind of lures him into her, her bed. Is She's talking about how I put out the good sheets and I put up, spray them with perfume and I have all this great incense going. And then she starts doing sort of a seductive talk. Um, let's go and enjoy all the pleasure we could ever want. And so this is, again, this is exactly how... The, this is the lure of adultery. It's exactly how it happens. Starts with lust, continues with smooth talk. It's sort of a trap. You're hooked a little bit. You do it in secret, and you, you're seduced. Okay, so this is what the Old Testament teaches us about adultery. And then we're moving on to the, the final topic, which is what the Old Testament uh, can tell us about the entire process of recovering from adultery. <laughs> Here, um, for this part, the entire process of recovering from adultery, I found it in Jeremiah uh, chapter 3, and it's in this chapter twice. So I'm going to try to point out to you like both times. The first part about uh, recovering from adultery is teaching. Okay, And you can find this in this chapter, Jeremiah 3. You find it in chapter 7 and 8, but also in chapter, in verse 20. And so what it's saying at that part, part, the prophet, Jeremiah, is talking simultaneously about people who actually are committing adultery, like I'm addressing you now, and also to the nation of Israel as a whole, how they were adulterous toward God. And I think he's honestly leaning toward the nation as a whole as they were adulterous toward their God. Okay. But what he does in these verses, 7 and 8, and verse 20, he will uh, he tells them you have been adulterous here's what adultery means you were seduced away into worshiping other gods now in the case of like adultery with a marriage you're seduced away into wanting something other than what is yours your wife your spouse your husband you're seduced away into that so he taught them here's what it is next was conviction Jeremiah did not say to the people, oh, by the way, here's what you do, here's some steps to help end, you know, do this and this. No, he said, God calls you to righteousness, repent. 
So in verse 12, see like in 7 and 8, then there's a little bit of talking. In verse 12, he comes up and he tells them, you have been adulterous, return to your God. And also again in uh, like chapter, in verse 20, a little bit of talking again, 22 to 23 is where he convicts them and he tells them what they need to do. They need to stop the sin and and live right, do the right thing. And this is what we kept trying to tell people. If you are committing adultery, stop. Stop what you're doing and do the right thing. You have to... Then the, the, the next step in the process of recovering from adultery is... Uh, like correction repentance this is where um, you are told you have you're guilty you have to stop you have to uh, admit your guilt so to speak and in uh, the first time he goes through he's there there's verse 12 well verse 13 tells him just admit your guilt and I won't be mad at you forever okay that's God's talking about again at that point he's talking about the being adulterous toward God but that's the same step that would happen in recovering from adultery. The loyal spouse's step would be that they have to not be mad forever. The disloyal spouse's step is that they have to repent. They have to admit their guilt. In verse 25 it is it. So the first time through it's verses 7 and 8, verse 12, verse 13. The second time through it's verse 20, verse 22 and 23. Now here in 20, verse 25. He tells them, repent. Just return to your God. And then the last part is training in righteousness. The first step is he teaches them, you're doing the wrong thing. The second thing is conviction. He tells, he calls it what it is. He says, return to being righteous. The third step, repent. You have to admit your guilt. And the fourth step would be training in righteousness. This means, okay, so the, the right step would be doing the right thing again. Here's how you do that. Okay? And so he does that in verses 14 and 15. He tells them, how they can return back and the hope that they have if they do return back that God will give them a shepherd who will guide them and sure enough he gives people like us to help guide you through your adultery recovering adultery so this is the entire process it's in found in Jeremiah 3 twice so here we have the entire process of recovering from adultery and so what we've learned today is that the Old Testament has a lot that is extremely relevant to adultery now. In the, in the, the time of grace, if you want to call it that, after Christ's death for Christians. God does not ever condone adultery under any circumstance. We can understand how adultery occurs, some of the steps that occur, and we understand the process of recovering from adultery. So I will leave you this, this one, with this one thought. If we are not adhering to God's word in order to resist physical adultery uh, here, you know, here and now in our marriages, then we are committing adultery against God by abandoning his way of thinking and supplanting it with what we want or our way of thinking. We are putting ourselves and our thoughts above God. And that is pretty much the summary of the Old Testament's precepts on adultery. When we put ourselves and our thoughts above God. I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope it has taught you a little bit. I, I know I learned a lot and I hope to continue to learn more with you. Uh, next week we will be going into the New Testament precepts on adultery. And you know how it is. The New Testament has a lot to say about adultery. And in the New Testament it is primarily more about sexual immorality kind of adultery. So we'll have a lot to talk about next week and hope to see you. I will be talking to you on my travels, so it'll be kind of fun. <laughs> so, all right. Thanks for uh, joining us and I hope you have a, a wonderful day. See you next week. Bye-bye.